If you've never seen Spam's world-famous brick-shaped cans, then Spam to you is probably just an unsolicited message. You'll probably lose it if you receive another one about exotic cat NFTs. Spam is an icon of the packaged meat industry. It's not the thing you don't want in your inbox, it's the legendary mystery meat in a tin box. And this is the story of how Spam was made. In the late 19th century, George A. Hormel took his years of experience in Chicago's slaughterhouses to Minnesota. In 1881, he opened his own livestock slaughtering and packaging facility in the small town of Austin. Ten years later, the company was incorporated as GOA Hormel & Co. George indeed started Hormel, but he wasn't responsible for Spam. The man that made Austin, Minnesota become Spam Town USA was actually George's son, Jay Hormel. Before Spam, GOA Hormel & Co. had introduced a fresh brand of canned ham in 1926, but they soon lost control of the market to their competitors. In order to offer cheaper alternatives, Hormel's rivals used inferior byproducts of hog butchery, such as snouts, ears, and lips in their brands. Nevertheless, Hormel refused to compromise on its product's quality. They continued using pure ham even though it meant lower sales. This was the dilemma Jay and Hormel's employees sought to solve with Spam. Their central concept was to develop a compact, family-sized can of pork with attractive branding. So, after a Hormel employee, Julius Zilgit, experimented with the 12-ounce can, the team began researching the processing of the product. At first, when they mixed the ingredients and heated them in sealed cans, they ended up with 8 ounces of meat and 4 ounces of juice. In other words, they were left with a can of worms. The juice became a cause of worry since their objective was not to make canned pork soup. And it would take them many years to discover how to stop the meat from juicing. They overcame the liquid obstacle by doing their mixing, canning, and heating inside a vacuum. The vacuum prevented the cellular breakdown that happened during heating which released the juices. Finally, Jay was ready to take over the world with his recipe. But his five-part formula for pork shoulder mixed with ham, salt, sugar, water, and sodium nitrate was nameless. To baptize his concoction, during a New Year's Eve party, Jay initiated a naming contest with a $100 prize. Kenneth Diagno won the contest. The New York actor, who was also the brother of a Hormel vice president, proposed the name Spam. He later revealed that he had always had the name in his head. It was a mixture of spice and ham. Even though Jay liked the name instantly, sodium nitrate will never pass for chili. Nevertheless, Jay went with Spam, and on the 5th of July 1937, the first cans of Spam were made available in United States stores. Spam was a product of necessity. In 1929, the year Jay took charge of Hormel as the president, the US entered its worst economic downtime. The Great Depression brought a lot of hardship with it, and many Americans just couldn't afford meat. Spam's initial marketing targeted housewives. The idea was to give them a low-cost, easy-to-prepare meat option. In those early years, people were naturally skeptical about this meat that they didn't have to refrigerate. But it soon grew on them. Spam and other canned meat products soon became staples on American tables. And although Spam appeared at the tail end of the Great Depression, it arrived just in time for World War II. This unfortunate period in human history was Spam's ticket into a greater world. The US military pumped it and other canned meat products abroad to all its camps. It bought up to 15 million cans of Spam per week to feed both US and Allied forces. Spam and others like it were the perfect wartime meat. They required little to no processing, and their long shelf life made them easy to transport and serve. During this period, Spam became so popular that a US Army Air Force unit paid homage to it by naming their camp Spamsville. It's safe to say Spam was revered in Spamsville, but as the war went on, many soldiers fed out of love with the can of pork and ham. You would too if you had to eat it for three meals every single day. I guess there's only so much Spam a man can stomach. Jay Cormel kept what he called a scurrilous file for the hate mail he received from disgruntled soldiers about Spam. Imagine a soldier trying to finish a hate mail about his dinner while taking cover from enemy fire. It's a ridiculous picture. In a 1945 New York interview, Jay told the interviewer, if they think Spam is terrible, they ought to have eaten the bully beef we had in the last war. He was referring to his time as a World War I veteran himself. When the fighting ended, World War II had taken Spam to a multinational consumer base. 
There was no way Hormel could have reached such an audience on its own in that time frame. Post-war complications further strengthened the demand for spam. The US government sent loads of it to Russia, England, and the Asia-Pacific, where famine had been a consequence of the war. They would commit over 100 million pounds of spam to the war effort. Now, let's observe one minute of silence for all the pigs that died to save humanity. Spam was enjoying global celebrity status, but at home in the US, it had been relegated to a side dish. It was sometimes used in sandwiches or fried eggs, but not much at the center of the plate where it used to be before and during the war. Now that's a good example of how familiarity breeds contempt. To persuade its original customers, Horma launched a massive publicity campaign. It employed the talents of popular musicians to soundtrack spam. They even had a radio show called Music with the Hormel Girls. World leaders, including former UK Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, former US President Dwight D. Eisenhower, and former Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev all praised Spam for its wartime impact. In Khrushchev's memoir, Khrushchev Remembers, he wrote, There were many jokes going around in the army, some of them off-color, about American Spam. It tasted good, nonetheless. Without Spam, we wouldn't have been able to feed our army. We had lost our most fertile lands. The World War II boost wove spam into the food culture of Japan, Korea, the Philippines, and especially Hawaii. The encounters of these cultures with spam inspired renowned local delicacies, like spam musabi, loco moco, and Korea's budai jigai, or army stew. Hawaii reportedly eats over 4 million cans of spam yearly. It also hosts the annual Wakiki Spam Jam, where spam enthusiasts from all over the world converge to celebrate the recipe. And just so you know, Korea is the second highest consumer of spam in the world, second to the US, of course. By 1959, Hormel had sold its 1 billion can of spam, and that was before it surpassed 8 billion in sales in 2012. Spam is now sold in over 45 countries, so Hormel has had to launch several varieties to attend to the needs of its diverse patrons. It introduced the 7 ounce can for singles and small families in 1962 and the Spam Light in 1992. In 2009, Hormel added potato starch as the sixth ingredient in Spam to improve its appearance after cooking. In recognition of Spam's place in history, its original label and the 1997 redesign now sit at the Smithsonian. Also, its rich history is on display at the Spam Museum in Austin, Minnesota, where it all started. Spam has transcended its notoriety as the mystery meat to become a historical product of mythical proportions. Lastly, next time you receive spam on your computer, blame Monty Python's Flying Circus. Now, like this video and subscribe to the channel, or I'll spam your emails with pictures of spam cans. So yeah, do it.